Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We I wanna thank you for um, attending and your patience with us here for the last few minutes. Um, my name is uh, David Rosenthal. I'm a head and neck radiation oncologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I'd like to introduce the rest of the um, panel with me. First, I will go as listed in order here. Dr. Uh, David Pfister is the chief of head and neck medical oncology and uh, co-leader of the head and neck um, disease management team and professor of medicine at the uh, Wheel College of uh, uh, Medical College of Cornell University. Um, Dr. Frank Warden is um, assistant professor in uh, medical oncology at the University of Michigan uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Yang Sun is the um, professor of the Department of uh, Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the Samsung Medical Center in, in Seoul, Korea. And then Lori Lovner is, um, pr spans multiple departments as professor of radiology, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania. So we have our um, different specialties uh, well represented for this multimodality panel. We are um, focusing on management of oropharynx cancer. I'm first gonna give an overview and uh, focusing on concurrent chemo radiation and uh, focusing on some of the gains and limitations uh, as, as achieved there. And then we're gonna hear about the inclusion of induction therapy, some of the in inclusion of new biomarkers in uh, prognosis, uh, prevention and treatment selection, as well as integrating the, the modalities of surgery in here with, with radiation and chemotherapy. Um, and followed by helping uh, uh, with the radiology techniques, especially with MRI and functional imaging to help us understand treatment response and perhaps to help us better with selection of therapy. So my uh, disclosures here first. So for oropharynx cancer, our treatment goals are first to optimize cancer control and survival. In order to do this, we have to have local control at the primary site, regional neck control, as well as distant control. We have to select our therapies that are adequate to address each and every one of these if we're gonna control the disease uh, in, in, in all of its aspects. We wanna do this, however, by preserving functional integrity Namely, this is, requires safe swallowing without aspiration or requirement for a feeding tube, and of course, breathing without a, laryngec a laryngectomy or a, 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 a tracheal cannula. And so we have to look at the different modalities, such as radiation versus conservation surgery techniques in order to um, achieve these and see how these are really non-competing modalities, how they can be complementary and we can select for individual um, patients. And in doing so, the goal is to minimize the toxicity, uh, especially the acute mucositis toxicity and the longer term effects on, on dysphagia. And treatment selection, looking at appropriate concurrent and induction regimens is very important um, you know, in this area. So I wanna propose a case to keep in mind as we're going through the rest of this discussion. The, um, this is a 46-year-old woman who uh, presented with a neck mass for which she underwent tonsillectomy and, and was found to have a, a TX, parenthesis 1, N2B, tonsil, poorly differentiated squamous cancer. So she had some relatively bulky disease, about three and a half centimeters at level two, and also some level three disease, somewhat smaller, with a very modest primary that, had, that has been removed. This is a healthy, previously healthy patient with, with no risk factors, non-smoker, never smoker, who uses only social alcohol. So what are the risks to this patient with respect to local control, regional control, distant control, and of course, functionality outcomes? So if we look to the NCCN guidelines for early or for late, later stage disease, um, what we, what we can see is that all of the alternatives are considered to be acceptable. So a patient like this has stage 4A disease. Chemo, concurrent chemoradiation is considered to be ac acceptable. 
but also is induction chemotherapy or surgery or else inclusion in multimodality clinical trials. So these guidelines aren't going to tell us what to do for these individual patients. Now, first, with respect to comparison of surgical and non-surgical techniques, there's now a large body of retrospective data suggesting that for oropharynx cancer, and in tonsil cancer in particular, is that the local control, local regional control, is very similar with surgical and non-surgical techniques. Most of these trials involve radiation therapy alone, but some with, uh, with chemoradiation. Similarly, if we look at overall survival, surgery versus radiotherapy, the control rates, the overall survival rates, you know, are very similar. There is one prospective phase three trial that included 119 patients that randomized patients between surgery and postoperative radiation versus radiation and concurrent chemotherapy with 5-FU and cisplatin that again showed the... Uh, the local regional control and survival rates were really, were really quite similar. There's been a significant change, though, in the management of oropharynx cancer in the United States over the last decade. Up through the late 1990s, uh, for, say, a T4 tongue-based tumor, as, as shown here, um, many patients um, were still treated in many centers with surgery that not only would it perhaps include total glossectomy, but as part of this uh, procedure because of aspiration risk or for additional margin, uh, laryngectomy as well. But currently, in many centers, chemoradiation is being used, um, you know, as an alternative, uh, you know, based on this, uh, you know, this prior data. And this is based on clinical trials that included stage 3 and 4 disease uh, patients. And so now the question is, are patients, in fact, being overtreated um, do many of these patients receive um, chemoradiation who may not all need it but be subjected to some of these toxicities? So Dr. Sun is going to be the next speaker who's going to speak on surgical uh, indications and new technologies um, in the management of, uh, of oropharynx cancer. Now, there are now at least 11 prospective randomized trials in head and neck squamous cancer comparing radiation alone versus concurrent chemoradiation, showing that the concurrent therapy improves local regional control or in survival in the range of 20 plus percent in, in many of these trials. If we look specifically for oropharynx cancer, there are three relevant trials. The Gore-Tec trial uh, led by Dr. Clay was exclusively oropharynx cancer. And then there were two additional trials that had planned um, subset analysis prospectively uh, stratified um, for oropharynx uh, cohorts as, as well. In these trials, all three showed that the addition of chemotherapy to radiation therapy in the concurrent setting improved overall survival. The Gore-Tec trial was a very um, important trial, I think, from the uh, changes in patterns of uh, treatment in the United States, especially, um, because this, first of all, had oropharynx only, and many of these patients, 85% of the patients had T3 or 4 disease, and three-quarters of the patients were node positive. And as you can see, the initial report at three years showed about a 20% improvement in, um, in overall survival. This, was, this article was published in JNCI in 1999 and accompanied by an editorial from Drs. Forestier and Trotti that included the statement, after more than two decades of combined modality trial, we can now recommend radiochemotherapy as a standard of care for locally advanced oropharyngeal cancer. But what does locally advanced mean? Does this mean all patients with stage 3 or 4 disease, are they all the same, or is there some inhomogeneity? Are there biologic factors that will help to separate out the risk factors and help guide our treatment selection? Well, if there's such good results for radiation and chemotherapy concurrently, why don't we give it to everybody with stage 3 or 4 disease? Well, the reason is uh, at least two or three-fold. First of all, 
not all of the patients need it. That is, there are going to be some patients who are going to do fine with single modality radiation therapy alone, plus minus neck dissection, who are not going to have a benefit from concurrent chemo radiation. Additionally, chemo radiation concurrently will add acute toxicity of mucositis, the risk of long-term dysphagia, and the toxicity may be disproportionate to the gain for some of these patients. It may not address patterns of failure. That is, concurrent chemoradiation trials have, in general, showed that there's improvement in local regional control, but not in reduction of distant metastases. So first, with respect to toxicity, I have just uh, the results of two phase three trials. One is the uh, Bonner trial with cetuximab with radiation versus radiation alone, and then uh, Dr. Brazil's trial with radiation versus chemoradiation for head and neck cancer. And what I want to point out is if you look at the difference between the two curves, these are the only patients that, that benefit. The patients in this group up here do not derive benefit from the addition of chemotherapy, and the patients down here do not need it. It's only the small group when you move between the two curves. But all of the patients are intoxicated by it. As can be seen in the Gore-Tec oropharynx, the mucositis, grade three, four mucositis, was almost doubled, and there was also a significant increase in late toxicities as well. So when we ask the question, is concurrent chemoradiation required to achieve local regional control for all patients with stage three and four disease, I point to uh, the published series from MD Anderson by my colleague um, Adam Garden that included 299 patients looking at TX, T1, and T2 disease. About 47% of them had tonsil cancer. They were treated with radiation therapy alone, no chemotherapy. The five-year local control was 92%. For T1 cohort, 99%. The regional control was also 90%, and for N2, 93%. If you combine these, the local regional control was almost 90, um, was almost 90%. And it is very interesting that it is the higher T stage, but not the N status, that predicts for local regional um, failure. Despite this, the, uh, and what we're seeing then is that the local regional risk of failure is 13%. The distant risk of failure actually exceeds that at 15%. If we give concurrent chemo radiation, it's unlikely that we're going to statistically show that we're going to be able to improve over 87%. But additionally, with concurrent chemo radiation, we are not addressing a pattern of failure risk that is greater than the local regional risk, but we are, of course, exposing the patients to toxicities. This just shows the local regional control by T stage and then the local regional recurrence free survival by N stage, showing that the N stage, the higher N stage, uh, does put patients at risk for increased distant metastases. Again, if we look at several of the published phase three trials, uh, including Dr. Edelstein's group, uh, ERTC, RTOG, um, uh, trials in, in this Gore-Tec uh, trial, what we can see is that the nodal pattern of failure can exceed um, half of the patients. And that clearly, while local regional control is improved with chemoradiation, there was no reduction in distant metastasis uniformly. Now, more recently, Dr. Posner has presented one of several um, uh, studies that have shown that induction chemotherapy by the addition of docetaxel to platinum and fuller uracil can improve overall survival 62 versus 48 percent uh, at the three-year point. So th this, what we call reversal, what has been called reversal of patterns of failure by Dr. Volks and Dr. Keyes, where the distant risk of failure can exceed the local regional risk is, is a significant factor to be overcome. So I asked Dr. Pfister on the panel, should induction chemotherapy be the new standard for all patients with significant nodal disease in order to address this pattern of failure risk? Now, what does the literature tell us about treatment selection for standard therapy? Well, 
for early stage disease, we want to use surgery or radiation therapy, and we're going to hear from Dr. Sun more about the, 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 the surgical aspects. But for more advanced disease, there's the suggestion that combined modality therapy you know, is important. But again, there's great differences in outcomes for individual patients reflecting heterogeneity in biology you know, that is not addressed. We've been relying primarily on AJCC staging for um, triage of patients because stage three and four disease is what was required for entry to clinical trials before, so it is now a knee-jerk reflex to, for many people to offer that to patients with stage three and four disease, considering them as a homogeneous group. But the AJCC staging does not take into account performance status, comorbidities, that is patient factors, it does not take into account many tumor factors, such as molecular markers, many of which are not fully validated, and does not consider the patterns of failure and toxicity issues you know, that we've discussed. So if you look at AJC, you can see here that there are approximately 30-odd groups, and that the majority, about 75% of tonsil cancers, are, end up being node positive. So the vast majority of disease, then, is stage three or four disease, as given in the example of our patient with a TX parenthesis one and two, uh, you know, tumor. So it's sort of this dichotomy or reductionism to early and late that has led to a problem in treatment selection. Now, if we look at this data, for instance, from Gen for Grandis, looking at the prognostic um, effects of the epiderma growth factor receptor, we can see that higher expression of the EGF receptor is a poor prognostic factor. And this has also been looked back in some of the radiation therapy trials as well. Uh, the, another important uh, biologic factor is HPV. One trial that we're involved in is the e ECOG 2399 reported by Dr. Schmelek that showed that um, there was a significant uh, proportion of patients that were HPV positive, and the HPV positive tumor patients were more likely to have more poorly differentiated, especially basaloid features, and have higher end-stage disease. But fortunately, they, they seem to have um, some better prognostic factors. And then just recently, what we've seen in, uh, from the University of, uh, of Michigan, and we're going to hear you know, much more detail ab about this from Dr. Warden, that combining HPV and EGF is probably the most significant factor in discriminating between the two groups. So I asked Dr. Warden, how should HPV status direct treatment selection? So finally, we want to ask, what are the chemoradiation questions that remain? When we give radiation therapy, do we want to give it once a day or twice a day in the chemotherapy setting? And this remains to be answered by the results of the RTOG trial that are still maturing. The other question is, can radiation therapy dose be reduced in any patients after, especially induction chemotherapy, when they've had major responses? With respect to chemotherapy questions, should all of the patients get induction who have significant nodal disease? Can it also help to improve local regional disease? What agents, what doses, and what are the treatment prognostic factors that may help in the, in the selection? So again, we want to come back to uh, th these treatment selection factors and see how these biologic and now how some of the imaging responses, um, as Dr. Lovner will explain to us, will be, will be helpful. So this is our case again, a 46-year-old non-smoker with T1N2B tonsil cancer, tonsil removed. What is the expected response to therapy? What are the competing risks for failure? And what is the optimal therapy for overall survival and toxicity reduction? So I want to turn over now to uh, Dr. Sun. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Young Ik Sun. I'm head and neck surgeon working at Samsung Comprehensive Cancer Center, Korea. It's a great honor for me to join this oral pharyngeal cancer panel, and I sincerely appreciate Dr. Jeffrey Myers, program chair of this meeting, and American Society for Therapeutic Radiology and Oncology. Well, under the title of Surgery Indication and New Technology, I will talk about the basic surgical approaches and recent advances in surgery. And in the later part of my talk, I will discuss about the surgical indication for management of oropharyngeal cancers, which is increasingly regarded as a predominantly non-surgical disease. <clears throat> 
There are four basic surgical approaches for oropharyngeal cancers, transoral, transparential, transcervical, and transmandibular. The first, transoral approach. Extended radical tonsillectomy or transoral lateral oropharyngectomy, tongue-based resections are all belongs to this category of approach. One or two centimeter of mucosal margin and a resection of superior constrictor muscle as a thin margin are usually recommended. Well, these are examples of transoral lateral oropharyngectomy uh, for orientation. This is uvula, this is the molar tooth of the maxilla and the mandible. And the lateral incision starts and pterygo mandibular rafe. Um, this section goes medially under the plane of superior constrictor muscles. And uh, we frequently see the fat covering the carotid artery and sometimes the branch of glossopharyngeal nerve during the dissection. And at the end of the dissection, prevertebral fascia carpet remains usually intact. So we don't need any kind of reconstruction in this case. We are expecting a very uh, wonderful functional outcome through this kind of approach. The second transparential approach. With the suprahyoid pharyngotomy approach, we can excise the tumor of the middle line of the tongue base with e easy and a posterior pharyngeal wall tumor. With the lateral pharyngotomy approach, we can uh, expose wonderfully about the tonsil area. Well, this is an example of a suprahyoid approach. Uh, this is a hyoid bone after releasing the suprahyoid muscles. We can get entry into the pharynx through the balacular area, just um, extirpation of the tongue-based neurogenic tumor in this case. This kind of surgery does not need um, hospitalization, so we can do this kind of surgery at the day surgery center, or we can discharge the patient at the same day of surgery. We, we just expect very little morbidity by this approach. The third, combined transoral and transcervical approach. It is better known as pull-through approach by making the intraoral incision here between the tongue and the gingival mucosa, we can pull out the tongue below the mandible like this. Uh, this pull-through approach is usually performed in conjunction with neck dissection, so this is the space where we can pull out the tongue out. Well, mandibular lingual release is another kind of transcervical approach. By this approach, we can release whole entire tongue and flow of mouth below the mandible into the neck by making intraoral incision from one side until the pillar of the tonsils goes along the gingival dental sursi and the other side of the anterior tonsil pillar. By this approach, we can avoid jaw splitting or lip splitting. Uh, please note, uh, this is mandible lingual release approach. We resect the, some part of the tongue here. Uh, please note wide exposure of the oropharyngeal area here. The last, transmandibular approach. The paramedian mandibulotomy is most widely used for the extensive tumors of the lateral tongue base or tonsil area. Well, this is example of paramedian mandibulotomy. Uh, please note the wide exposure of the oropharyngeal area we can um, preserve the mental nerves and genioglossus and genioide musculatures here to preserve the function. Well, sometimes we need segmental mandibulectomy, especially when case of tumor embedded mandible, inferior alveolar nerve or canal, if there is massive soft tissue disease adjacent to the mandible. Well, this is the example, exposure, segmental resection of the mandible as a block, resected specimen, reconstruction with uh, osteocutaneous preflap, and reconstruction plate. Well, what are the recent advances in surgery? Well, there will be many, but I will uh, briefly mention about the robotic surgery, sparing the lower lip spreading incision for cosmetic reason, and the concept of perforator flaps. Well, there are uh, many excellent presentations and extensive discussions about the transoral robotic surgery at the earlier part of this meeting, so I will just focus on the recent publication of the Dr. Weinstein, University of Pennsylvania. They used the Da Vinci robotic systems, and uh, they also used the 5 millimeter robotic arms, which has uh, Maryland type dissectors and monopolar electrocautery that has a spatula or the hook type. According to their experience of 27 patients of tonsil cancer patient, uh, they could get uh, negative surgical margins in most of the patient, and uh, 96 patients had no dysphagia after the surgery. So 
the biggest, greatest advantage of this kind of approach was a magnified three-dimensional view in all directions, so facilitating the resection of the tongue base, gross pharyngeal fold, and tonsils under direct visualization. Well, even though there are some modifications to camouflage these lower lips breathing incisions, um, some disfigurements are inevitable in this kind of patient. So there are several uh, trials to do a transmandible approach while uh, avoiding lower lip spreading applause. For example, uh, double mandibular osteotomy and visor flaps. So I will introduce Dr. Beck's technique. Well, after making the incision, uh, we make uh, so parietal tunneling between the two mental nerves. Here we can make the stepwise mandibulotomy here while retracting the lower lip inferiorly. So we can um, resect larger tumor without any difficulty, um, reconstruct the area with uh, free flaps and fixation with mini plates. So this picture is taken three days after the surgery. Well, these are pictures of different two patients of tonsil cancers approached by transmandibular but with a lower lip spreading. As you see, six months after, one month after, they have wonderful cosmetic and functional result. The concept of perforated flaps using the terminal branch of the vessels here made us enable to design a very large flaps and seen or sick flaps and pliable flaps, double flaps from one donor site or chimeric flap from one donor site. So this concept made us to design recipient specific reconstruction even in the complex three-dimensional defect of oropharyngeal area. It's roughly um, developing area. So, before selecting the optimal treatment, we know we have to consider these two factors, maximum oncological safety and least disturbance in functions. What do we know about the treatment? In early stage, radiotherapy alone, surgery alone, will be quite effective and equally effective, but in advanced stage of disease, we need multimodality treatment. Uh, combined chemo radiation therapy is much better than radiation alone. Surgery followed radiation is much better than surgery alone. Uh, there was an excellent study about the trends in the treatment of advanced oropharyngeal cancer. They used over 42,000 patient data between 1985 to 2001. According to this data, uh, combined chemo radiation increased from 15 to 29 percent, whereas the radiation alone decreased from 42 to 27 percent. But the cancer-directed surgery remained stable unchanged regardless of the facility types and it became the number one till 2001. So this is a 46-year-old gentleman visited the emergency unit because of the parsatile bleeding from his neck. We tried to stop the bleeding by compressing the neck but it was only temporarily uh, effective. He was diagnosed as T4 N3 M0 tonsillar squamous carcinoma without evidence of any HPV association. So what are you gonna do for this patient? Well, we have to do the neck dissection because of the active bleeding, and we performed the free flap reconstruction. We could not completely remove the neck disease, so tumor board agreed to start combined chemo radiation therapy. It was quite successful, but unfortunately, we have to stop in the middle because we subsequently found this axillary lymph node during the therapy. So we switched into chemotherapy, but the disease showed a rapid progression. Now he's on the palliative radiation therapy because of the pain and trismus in this area. So uh, we must know the, which is the most significant prognostic factors. Um, the presence of lymph node metastasis usually results in 50% reduction of survival. Extra capsule spread and positive surgical margin are pretty well-known prognostic factors. As you may expect, a large tumor volume, whether it is primary or the nodal, may influence the treatment outcome. So extra capsule spread, this is micros macroscopic, microscopic, and no extra capsule spread survival. As you see here, after three years of treatment, even microscopic extracapsular spread showed the similar survival data as gross extracapsular spread. Not surprisingly, extracapsular spread percentage correlated with the numbers of involved in the lymph node, size of the lymph node, and the pathological end staging of the lymph node. 
What about the tumor volume? Even though there are many controversies about this topic, more papers are in favor that tumor volume has correlation with treatment outcome. So bulky N2 and 3 neck disease management for that disease also has correlation with uh, this concept. So what are you going to do if the patient with N2 N3 shows complete response after radiotherapy or combined chemotherapy? Well, there will be two options, plant neck dissection or close follow. The rationale for this is uh, we will see high rates of residual neck disease found in plant neck dissection specimen even in the complete responders. But if you closely follow up without any intervention in this population, you will see very low, 5% or less, rates of isolated neck recurrence. That's the rationale for this opinion. Here is another approach for uh, N2 or greater neck disease. Neck dissection first, then radiation or combined chemo or radiotherapy. Uh, the rationale for this approach is salvage neck dissection is really successful. Uh, neck dissection as a combined modality will get the better treatment outcome, and neck dissection before this radiation will result in a little morbidity. So anyway, according to these reports, regional control rate reaches up to 100 percent. So I think this is one viable option for N2 or greater neck disease patient. Let me summarize the surgical indication for oral pineal cancers. For early stage of disease, T1, T2, we can excise the tumor transorally or transpharyngeally without leaving any functional disability. And um, we may avoid the, the additional radiation therapy. We can get the, the very nice uh, treatment outcome. If this patient has any end disease, surgical neck dissection as a combined modality will give us the better treatment outcome. Again, neck dissection. Uh, in this case, will leave a little morbidity. And for any end case, if we do neck dissection, we can get the precise end staging, including extra capsular status, spreader status. For N2, N3 bulky neck disease, surgery can be used as a planned neck dissection after CCLT, or surgery can be done in advance before radiation and chemo radiotherapy, as I, I explained before. Uh, for selected T3 and T4 cases, um, we can use the surgery as a salvage, but uh, also as a primary treatment, especially when the patient has very general poor condition like uh, inadequate renal functions or poor uh, hematological profiles, previous heavy radiation, etc. So let me summarize this. Well, even though uh, the chemo radiation is gaining more popularity to treat oropharyngeal cancers, I would say surgery is still an essential and inevitable treatment strategy, and it will remain as one of the important uh, treatment options in most of the oropharyngeal cancers. Well, these treatment modalities are not exclusive to each other, but I think they are very synergistic in together. Um, thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. The, uh, the uh, time I talk, I'll provide you um, at least my interpretation of the rationale and current role of induction chemotherapy in oral pharynx cancer. Uh, my disclosures are uh, listed at the bottom, include clinical trial support. Uh, also, I'm going to talk about uh, the NCCN guidelines, as did Dr. Rosenthal, and obviously we're a member institution. One of the things I'd like to emphasize at the, uh, at the start uh, and, and is that um, while the learning objective is to understand the indications, contraindications, rationale, and option for induction chemotherapy and share with you the data that I think is most relevant in that regard, that unlike, let's say, the surgery oral pharynx literature or the uh, radiation oral pharynx literature, is when you look to uh, evaluate data to guide us regarding the role of uh, chemotherapy or induction chemotherapy for oral pharynx cancer, uh, you're not going to see a lot of either site-specific phase two studies, uh, let alone site-specific phase three studies. Uh, the one site-specific phase three study that I was aware of that used induction chemotherapy was the one from France that uh, Dr. Rosenthal provided. And so we do need to lean on uh, the results of, of 
randomized studies, which included other sites besides the oral pharynx. But when you look in the recent uh, years, if a local region advanced head and neck study uh, does not have a specific, uh, let's say, endpoint like larynx preservation, when you look at the, uh, the, the breakdown of the primary sites, they're uh, typically predominantly oral pharynx anyway. So I, I think it's reasonable to lean on some of these other sources of data uh, to guide us. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I'll give you uh, an answer to uh, um, Dr. Rosenthal's query as, to, as whether induction should be a routine standard of care for these patients. So induction chemotherapy, what is there not to like? Uh, as local regional control has improved, distant metastasis has increased. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal shared with you the data from the uh, folks and keys analyses. And induction chemotherapy allows early treatment of microscopic and distant disease. As morbidity of concurrent chemoradiation therapy is increasingly appreciated, again, another point that Dr. Rosenthal emphasized, induction chemotherapy allows a few things. One, time to optimize the patient's medical status uh, to get ready for the rigors of a concurrent treatment. Secondly, uh, response to induction uh, perhaps allows us to customize the radiation dosing, uh, certainly a relevant and active area of investigation, and with that, a possible improvement in uh, local regional control. Um, the type of response to induction chemotherapy potentially facilitates triage to appropriate local therapy. Again, Dr. Warden is going to follow me, and I believe he'll elaborate on this uh, further. But again, uh, most of you in the room are aware of the VA Larynx Preservation Study, the ARTC Hypopharynx Study. Uh, the University of Michigan uh, uh, has uh, an experience using one cycle of induction chemotherapy, mainly as a predictor to determine uh, whether to proceed with uh, uh, radiation-based therapy or to surgical therapy, depending on the response after that one cycle. They presented data both with a larynx preservation endpoint, but also with uh, focused on oropharynx cancers. And, and finally, uh, even though the emphasis of our presentation this morning is on uh, local region advanced disease, that this data regarding the response to induction is something which is even being pulled very to the earlier cases. And so probably the best known research in this area, I think, is from France, from uh, uh, Dr. Lecurier, where basically they give a few cycles of induction chemotherapy, and if it looks like the person's a CR, they watch them without doing any uh, uh, radiation-based uh, or surgery-based treatment. So to summarize, induction chemotherapy potentially allows the possibility to decrease overall morbidity, yet at the same time while improving survival. So how can you not like that idea? Now, what are the caveats of induction chemotherapy? Um, Historically, although patterns of failure may be affected, the impact on overall survival has been disappointing, and this is something I'm going to provide some data on shortly. It ends up converting what, if you give chemoradiation, is roughly two months of treatment, it ends up adding two to four months to the duration of treatment, something that's not trivial. And f finally, it may adversely affect compliance with local regional treatment and the choice of the concurrent agents, things which I'll elaborate on further. So what I'm going to start with is provide some data that highlights some of the caveats, and then, I'll, uh, um, and then I'm going to move to data that sort of uh, highlights some of the, uh, you know, very exciting new data regarding induction chemotherapy. So Dr. Rosenthal went through a number of different concurrent versus radiation studies, and this is from the mock meta-analysis, which looks at uh, different ways to integrate chemotherapy with uh, uh, local regional treatment. And certainly what you come away with here is that uh, concomitant therapy seems to be most easily the way to demonstrate uh, a benefit in terms of survival. Both neoadjuvant or induction and adjuvant didn't yield to a significant improvement in overall uh, survival. Now, the, uh, again, these weren't all oropharynx patients, although certainly a number of them were oropharynx. But one of the points I'd like to point out here uh, in this when you talk about the uh, induction concurrent debate uh, that within this induction group here, the one positive study was the one actually that Dr. Rosenthal showed, which was an induction in oropharynx cancer. But overwhelmingly, most of the studies showed no improvement in uh, survival. Now, proponents of uh, induction will say, well, if you limit this to patients who got induction cisplatinum 5-FU, which is the kind of the, the most widely used standard, generally viewed as the most efficacious induction, that actually on subset analysis, actually induction ends up becoming significant. And so, but to counterbalance that, 
if you take the concomitant data and you take the data where cisplatinum is used as an agent, and you look at the mortality reduction there, it also is more potent than what you see here. And actually, if you compare concurrent platinum radiation versus induction platinum 5-FU, uh, the concurrent therapy is associated with three times the improvement in overall survival that you get from induction. And so when I talk about the potential impact that induction might have on the local regional treatment, keep in mind these data in terms of what the proportional benefits that we're talking about here and what you potentially might jeopardize. Again, one of the things that Dr. Rosenthal talked about was uh, this issue of the distimatasis and the ability of, of induction to impact in distimatasis. Well, one of the things to, uh, and he threw out the back of the envelope estimate, which is a reasonable one of around 15%. So again, this is, uh, this is not orphanage cancer. This is from uh, R2G 9111, which Dr. Rosenthal alluded to. And uh, if you look at the radiation alone arm, so no systemic treatment whatsoever here, the five-year distant metastasis rate was 22%. So, you know, head and neck cancer is not like breast cancer or other diseases where, you know, the distant metastatic rate is, you know, it, this, it's real, but it's not uh, gigantic. If you look at the impact of the chemotherapy here, again, a reduction, but again, a fairly modest reduction. So you're talking about going back to his concept of, well, gee, how much therapy are you giving to impact on a particular outcome? You can see that close to 80% of patients probably weren't going to feel distantly in the first place. And so you're having to potentially give a lot of added systemic therapy for potentially modest benefits. Another issue has to do with going back to my, this idea of how the induction potentially impacts on the concurrent part of therapy. These are from the NCCN guidelines, the list of potentially uh, most recommended uh, concurrent programs, with cisplatinum alone being the preferred based on the 2008 guidelines. But what you commonly see after induction, because the patients are a little beat up and a little tired from the induction, that they often go with, uh, you know, something which might be kind of a little bit better tolerated than, than any of these. And uh, so, for example, they might go with weekly carboplatin or something like that. And yet, uh, in this Greek study, randomized study, looking at uh, cisplatinum radiation, carboplatin radiation versus radiation alone, while it wasn't designed to compare cisplatin to carboplatin, you certainly get a little caution here to what extent is that decision to go away from cisplatinum to accommodate induction, what impact that might have on the concurrent part of therapy. And I think the last point before I long go on to the sort of what I view as sort of the, um, the justification for induction is from this Italian study which basically randomized patients with unresectable or resectable uh, squamous cell head and neck cancer, prospectively determined to either induction platinum 5-FU followed by either surgery and radiation if you were uh, resectable or radiation alone if you were unresectable. And what you found is the patients who got induction had a uh, significant decrease in metastasis and trend for overall survival. Uh, if you just took out the inoperable patients, that uh, it did, this did translate in that subset analysis to a significant improvement. But if you looked at the operable patients, that there remained a significant decrease in dysmetastasis, but actually local regional control was worse on the people that got induction therapy. So it highlights how there are a lot of things that should, should make sense, that this should get better, but that when you go to operationalize as part of multimodality therapy, it doesn't all logically go the way we hope. And so you need to be very cautious as, as we move forward. Now, why have these induction studies not been as impressive as we'd like? Well, potentially the induction chemotherapy is not as effective as we thought it could be. With competing causes of mortality, the studies were notoriously underpowered. Uh, oftentimes, the role of treatment intent and sequence in terms of the quality control of these things uh, didn't get the attention that it deserved. The quality control of the local treatment, i.e. after an induction chemotherapy, did they get exactly the same operation they would have or did they get a lesser operation? And patient selection. For example, if you use induction in a setting where you would anticipate there are going to be low rate of distant metastasis, you're probably not going to have a, a big impact on the outcome. And part of the reason that I think we're in an exciting time regarding these new induction regimens and their evaluation is that we have a much better insight in terms of how to look at these limitations in design studies to evaluate these new agents to really identify what settings they are potentially going to be a biggest benefit. And so, you know, why is induction chemotherapy had this big resurgence? Uh, there have been a few randomized studies which basically have made the transition from doublet therapy with platinum 5-FU to triplet therapy with uh, a taxane, either doxetaxel uh, 
or a PACL tax, and I'll show you both sets of data, uh, um, with the Platinum 5FU. And this is the um, uh, randomized study, TAX 324, from the uh, Dana-Farber Center. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal provided the results of this, so I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through those results, but it, but it gives you a visual for the design of the triplet versus the doublet, and then everyone got carboplatin weekly with daily radiotherapy. And again, I emphasize this carboplatin weekly would not be viewed in the big world of concurrent therapy as a first-line concurrent program. Why might that have been chosen? So that they tolerate the concurrent part of therapy after the induction. And what are the implications of that? This study was designed, I emphasize, as a study to, sh to d evaluate whether TPF was superior to PF as induction. It was not designed as a study to evaluate whether the added, the addition of induction to subsequent concurrent theory improved outcome compared to current alone, something which I'll talk about more shortly. But it isn't just TAX 324, TAX 323 uh, from uh, uh, Jan Vermorken, and the RTC. Uh, Similar in design to the uh, TAX324, except that it was followed by radiation alone. And the dosing of the doxetaxel and the cisplatin 5 were slightly different. Uh, the doxetaxel was the same dose. The cisplatin was a little lower at 75 per meter squared as opposed to 100 mg per meter squared. And the 5-FU was a day longer, but it was a, a lower dose, 750 mg per meter squared. But as you can see here, again, overall survival improved with TPF. Response rates were consistent with benefit. And in this study, uh, they were very fastidious, not just in terms of reporting toxicity. There was more alopecia, more mild suppression with the TPF. But they also looked at quality of life and comprehensively induction. And really, there was no evidence to suggest poor tolerance with the uh, TPF. Actually, there were actually a few more treatment-related mortality, as I recall, on the, TP, uh, on the platinum 5 FU arm than on the TPF arm. Running with this concept from induction followed by radiation to the organ preservation setting, this is TPF versus PF as induction in an organ preservation study from the Gore-Tec. And you see response rate, three-year larynx preservation rate, and compliance. Again, an indirect measure of uh, tolerance better with the TPF. Again, this was with doxetaxel. The, uh, I mentioned before that it's not just with doxetaxel, but also there's data for paclitaxel. This is from the Madrid group randomization between paclitaxel plus platinum 5 FU versus platinum 5 FU alone. And again, when you look at the outcomes of interest, um, improvement with the uh, paclitaxel platinum 5 FU. And so if you're looking at potentially using an induction regimen, I think that clearly the data from my perspective is quite compelling that the triplet with a taxane, uh, either doxetaxel or paclitaxel, the larger experience is with doxetaxel followed by platinum 5 FU, but you have randomized data for both. Uh, is superior to platinum 5 FU. The, um, there are a wave of phase two studies adding more drugs to that, to a targeted therapy. Some, this would be viewed as, as investigational, something I would not recommend off protocol, but certainly we're interested to see the results of those studies. Now, how does this start, given the, uh, the, my initial introduction, the data that showed that, well, gee, what are the caveats you're thinking about? And then this newer day was certainly suggested that, uh, that the triplet is a real deal. Uh, how does this fit into the big picture here? And for completeness here, uh, Dr. Rosenthal referred to the NCCN guidelines. And one of the things I'm going to point out here, and again, we'll focus on oral pharynx, but this provides the data for the other sites as well, is that uh, while the oral pharynx, uh, it, that both the induction and the concurrent are listed as options, that the, uh, that the, um, the, the concurrent program among NCCN centers, which is, again, 20-plus, uh, the weight of the uh, sort of consensus was that the concurrent was the recommended approach. The, while the induction followed by concurrent was listed certainly as an option, as the slide that Dr. Rosenthal showed, that it was a uh, sort of a Category 3 recommendation, which meant that there was major disagreement um, among the panel. Okay? So there's an option, but a number of very experienced uh, head and neck oncologists sort of, again, struggling with this the way I'm sure many of you in the room struggle with this. Um, the other thing is that another insight in terms of what represents the standards of care is not just what you see in major uh, um, practice guideline groups like the NCCN or ASCO, but also look at the control arms of major randomized study. Because again, to, you know, when you do a randomized study, you know, the uh, A, there needs to be a legitimate question that 
the, that there's equipoise between the two arms. If you knew the answer, you wouldn't do the study. Uh, and also that the control arm for that study needs to be viewed as a legitimate standard of care. And generally, if you look at the lo patients with local regional disease now, there are two flavors to these randomized studies. Uh, one is induction followed by concurrent versus concurrent alone, which and here are three randomized studies which are in progress looking at that. Um, I think with the exception of the SWOG, the other two studies are not site-specific. Um, the other one is one which for which the current R2G randomized studies example, which is concurrent cisplatinum radiation plus another drug given concurrently, in this case cetuximab, uh, versus cisplatinum and radiation alone. And so again, you see here of these two different types of randomized studies, what are the control arms of those studies? Concurrent chemotherapy radiation. So what are the conclusions I come away with from the data I just presented you? That certainly the available randomized data indicate the TPF, and by TPF I mean a taxane, uh, and again I showed you data for both doxotaxel and paclitaxel, is superior to PF as an induction regimen. Uh, even with this efficacy, though, trials must be carefully designed to evaluate the impact of the triplet in other induction regimens for some of the methodologic issues which can confound the interpretation. Until more data are available, concurrent chemoradiation, I feel, remains an appropriate standard treatment option for patients with local regionally advanced disease in a standard to which new approaches is compared, as highlighted in those list of randomized studies on the two slides ago. In ongoing randomized controlled trials, evaluating the role of induction chemotherapy deserve our support. Now, getting back to Dr. Rosenthal's initial query about, well, as far as induction is standard of care, those prior two conclusion slides are kind of your typical talk, milk and toast. And, uh, and here, let me say, just put myself on the spot here. And I said, should induction now be given routinely to patients with local regionally advanced disease? And I would say there, no. I think that the, uh, that uh, I really, it, while it is listed as an option, I think going with concurrent chemo radiation in 2008 is a very defensible way to go here. Um, but given sort of the evolution of the data and the availability of these options, what are cl clinical scenarios in which, as um, someone that sees a lot of head and neck cancer, that I kick around the integration of induction, mindful of what I just said? And I'll, I'll list five here, which may be helpful to you in your own practices. Uh, one has to do when you get that patient who has this kind of question of distant METs, uh, you sort of, it's a more compelling local regional problem to go biopsy the lung, you're, you're not quite sure what to do. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they're, they're running into pain issues and so forth. You, you feel that you need to sort of proceed. We often will go with initial induction there and kind of reassess as we go. Uh, there are certain patients that are going to be delaying radiation simulation, but they got a very active problem. We'll often go with induction under those circumstances so that the patient isn't just waiting around. Uh, if there's an impending local issue, this tends to be a more of an issue, let's say, with laryngeal cancer, where potentially an early response to induction may avoid a, a tracheostomy. But again, an area where we might consider using induction as opposed to going directly to concurrent, where the initial treatment effect and swelling may potentially tip the person over with regard to local regional symptom. Markedly advanced disease. Certainly the rule of thumb is that there's a direct correlation between uh, bulky neck disease and distant metastasis. So if you have bulky, particularly low neck disease, patients with dermal infiltration, certainly that is a scenario where I kick around the, in, the, in, the incorporation of induction. And then the last one, which I think will be a lead into what Frank is going to talk about, has to do with the issue of patient selection. We sometimes use the induction as a way to accommodate a delay in decision making regarding appropriate local regional therapy of which a organ preservation strategy uh, in patients with markedly advanced disease. They may have very, very advanced disease. The radiation oncologist talks and says, gee, I really am very pessimistic we're going to clear this with uh, surgery. Patient says, I definitely don't want to go for an operation or like, can't we try something else first? Every once in a while you're very surprised by compelling response to induction. It often makes the patient feel, if they don't respond, a lot more accepting of the decision to go to surgery. If they have a huge response, it often makes us feel a lot better about going to radiation. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, I'd like to thank the um, organizers of this meeting for inviting me to talk to you today about um, human papillomavirus.
For many of you, this may be a review as this has been a recurrent um, theme throughout the course of this meeting. But I'd like to talk um, on various areas in terms of prognosis, prevention, and treatment selection. Um, I, these are my disclosures. I am a member of Speakers Bureaus for Santa Fe Aventus, Implone, and Bristol Myers Squibb. And up front, I'd like to um, acknowledge Mara Gillison and her group from Johns Hopkins for the use of some of their slides that I've adapted into this presentation over the course of the last couple of ASCO meetings where this topic has become um, at the forefront. So when we look at head and neck cancer, we know that tobacco and alcohol are the leading um, risk factors for this disease. Other risk factors include um, occupational exposures, diets poor in fruits and vegetables, um, and chronic viral infections, namely EBV and HPV, accounting for about a third of these um, cancers. Looking at head and neck cancer in terms of survival, we can see that the survival um, over the course of um, the last few decades has steadily increased, and the median age has um, taken a, um, a decline. And looking at the various subtypes of head and neck cancer, there's also been a decrease in oral cavity, larynx, and other types, but an increase in the number of um, oral pharyngeal cancers um, since the late 1970s to the present day. And this is primarily due to um, the human papillomavirus. As we know, it's a small circular DNA virus um, for which there are 130 unique types, and there are high and low risk subtypes of this virus. The virus, again, is very small, and the two important oncoproteins are E6 and E7. These transforming proteins bind to P53 and to um, the rival um, retinoblastoma protein, in which um, E2 is then upregulated, which then um, causes an upregulation of P16, which is now a marker um, for these tumors uh, by immunohistochemistry. So we know that in cervical cancer, the um, human papillomavirus is the um, sole etiologic agent. In terms of head and neck cancer, in the late 70s and early 80s, we began to see an association with this and what drove a lot of um, Dr. Gillison's work and the fact that um, human um, papillomatosis or juvenile human papillomatosis was related to um, in utero exposure of human papillomavirus. So again, compared to cervical cancer where the HPV is the, the sole etiologic agent, we look at these other cancers and find that there are other confounding variables that actually lead to the cause of these tumors, making it more difficult to say that the virus itself in a particular patient may be causing this cancer. In the United States, there's been an epidemic since the um, early 1970s to the, the present age, and there have been an increase in the number of tonsillar cancers at about 4% per year, and the number of base and tongue cancers at about 2% rise per year. And this epidemic is not um, necessarily associated to just the United States, but is also worldwide. As we can see from data presented at ASCO this year, that there's a threefold increase in the number of HPV-related tumors um, from the early 1970s to the present day, with an increase, a sharp increase in the number of um, white males um, being exposed to the virus and then contracting these um, illnesses. In terms of um, HPV re being related to other tumor sites in the head and neck, this is also true, with the oropharynx again being the most common site. This study was um, published by Mork and colleagues in 2001, and it was also the first study to show us that there is a serologic relationship between, these t um, the, uh, between the HPV and the development of these tumors. So what they did in this study is they drew serologies and then monitored the patients. And over the course of 10 years or so, they could see, compare the serologies to the development of these tumors. So this study is the first study to give us an idea about the latency period of the development of these tumors after exposure, being somewhere maybe between 10, 15, or 20 years. So HPV-16 is the predominant viral isolate. Um, 1831 and 33 have also um, been implicated. And these tumors, again, primarily reside in the oral pharynx um, involving the crypts of the palatine tonsils. They're poorly differentiated basaloid pathology, so it's not uncommon for these patients to present saying they have a small lump in their neck, and then in the course of a couple to a few weeks, develop large bulky tumors in their necks. They're usually amongst non-smokers and non-drinkers. They're younger age patients. And patients with HPV tumors have a more favorable prognosis, as we'll talk about, and now we know are linked to um, high-risk sexual behaviors. And this was the landmark study published um, in 2007 by Dr. Gillison and Dr. Sousa in um, the New England Journal of Medicine that actually brought about the association of HPV and um, sexual activity. 
And what they did in this study was um, a case control study where they took 200 patients who had oral pharyngeal cancers and compared them to about 200 patients who had benign conditions who presented to the Johns Hopkins Clinic for things such as earwax removal, strep throats, et cetera. And what they found is that they were at an overwhelming larger um, risk if you had cancer in the cases to have been exposed to HPV compared to the case controls. And they also looked to see if these patients were seropositive as well as having infections um, not only with HPV-16 but um, any um, HPV subtype in the oral cavity. And this was the link they found between the oral um, sexual partners and um, the development of these cancers, meaning that there's a dose um, relationship here. The increasing number of sexual partners led to um, the risk of developing this cancer at a greater rate, as again with the um, number of oral sexual partners increasing, your risk also increased. So how should we treat these HPV-related um, cancers? Um, and in particular, how should we treat locally advanced um, squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck? So we're really talking about tumors who pre prevent, are, are tumors that present with large, bulky nodal disease. Um, certainly, um, surgical resection is um, possible, but due to the great amount of disfigurement from these surgeries, chemotherapy and radiation therapy has become a standard. As we see now in this meta-analysis has been presented um, a few times already in this session that combined chemoradiation primarily with the platinum-based chemotherapy um, with radiation has become now standard of care. So this is a study that was published this year in the JNCI um, by the ECOG group that Dr. Rosenthal briefly mentioned and um, looked at advanced patients with oral pharynx and larynx cancer that were treated with induction chemotherapy followed by combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy. They found patients who were HPV positive in the oropharynx and those that were negative, and in the larynx, um, none of the patients actually were HPV positive. These were large, bulky tumors, um, again with basaloid pathology, and the subsites of the oropharynx are listed here. In terms of response rates, those who were HPV positive did much better in terms of treatment with chemotherapy alone, as well as, complete, uh, as, well as with treatment with the protocol in its entirety. And if you look at the overall survival curves, we can see that those who are HPV positive fare much better than those who are HPV negative. The same survival curve holds true if you just look primarily at those um, patients with oral pharynx only. So in conclusion, the authors from the ECOG um, 2399 um, tell us that um, tumor HPV status is strongly associated with therapeutic response to survival, something that we now um, have come to know and that risks and benefits of intense combined modality therapies should be considered separately for both HPV-positive and HPV-negative patients. So the question now becomes, how should we treat these patients and how should we treat them differently? And finally, the HPV status um, or an appropriate clinical surrogate, i.e. P16 by immunohistochemistry, should be included as a stratification factor in clinical trials for oropharynx cancer patients. So, I'll leave you then with um, remaining questions, and these are questions that are, are starting to um, come to the forefront that need answers. In term, mainly, should HPV and non-HPV related tumors be treated the same intensity, or should we treat them differently? Um, where does induction chemotherapy play a role? Um, as a member of the NCCN guideline panel, as Dr. Pfister alluded to, there is much controversy about the use of induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation for locally advanced oropharynx cancer patients. Um, those who believe in induction chemotherapy think that it will help decrease distant METs. But in patients with HPV, um, there is also the camp that thinks that um, using induction chemotherapy may overtreat these patients, putting them at higher risk of undue toxicity. And can radiation therapy be used alone for lower volume tumors? There's work ongoing now at MD Anderson where patients are receiving induction chemotherapy, and if they have low volume tumors at the primary site or in the lymph nodes, they're receiving radiation therapy alone on their clinical trials. Uh, patients with more advanced disease are receiving combined chemo radiation. So perhaps we can actually tailor our treatment so that it can be less intensive um, than the previous um, chemo radiation regimens that cause um, a lot of a toxicity that has previously been reported. And finally, um, what role will therapeutic vaccines play? And should they um, be integrated as a part of our treatment strategies with combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy? So does HPV status alone determine prognosis? So we hear over and over again that people who are HPV positive, that's good, they will respond better to treatment. But is that an, enough to say that? 
Um, so we have information here that was presented um, in um, the JCO um, from, again, the Hopkins group. And they looked at nine different tumor registries and basically found that the trends were the same as been previously reported, that since the early 1970s to the course of the present time, there has been a sharp rise in the number of HPV-related malignancies. And there's also been a rise in the number of um, young white males who've been developing um, this illness and then subsequently these cancers. They also looked at the benefits of radiotherapy and no radiotherapy. And as you can see, stage for stage, those patients who are HPV positive who received radiation therapy overall did better and had a better prognosis. The rise in the regional stage probably reflects the better treatments in terms of combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And then again, those patients who are HPV positive and didn't receive radiation therapy actually did not um, fare as well. So shifting gears, I'd like to talk a little bit about the work we've done at the University of Michigan that was published um, actually this month in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where we looked at various clinical factors and biomarkers um, as indicators of response to therapy and survival in oral pharyngeal cancer patients when we used a, a particular chemo selection strategy for organ preservation in these patients. So in our study, we registered patients and collected um, tumor markers and then treated them with induction chemotherapy with high-dose cisplatin at 100 milligrams per meter squared and 5 fluorouracil at 1,000 milligrams per meter squared per day for five days or carboplatin if they weren't candidates um, for cisplatin. Um, patients were then taken to endoscopy, and if their tumors shrunk by more than 50% as predetermined by the surgeon, those patients went on to receive standard chemotherapy and radiation therapy with cisplatin at 100 milligrams per meter squared on days 1, 22, and 43. Those patients, on the other hand, um, who did not fare as well or their tumors did not respond by more than 50% were treated with salvage surgery up front followed by radiation therapy. Eight weeks following chemoradiation, patients were taken back to the OR and biopsies were performed. If they were histologically negative, they were then went on to receive neck dissection followed by, if they were candidates, followed by two cycles of adjuvant paclitaxel chemotherapy. This work was driven primarily by work um, that we published on organ preservation in the larynx, where we found that treatment with induction chemotherapy up front could actually predict for biologically which patients who could respond to chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and our overall survival rates, even at six or seven years, remain in the high 70s to 80%. In this particular study, we enrolled 69 patients, 66 of which were valuable. Again, they were patients with large um, tumors, majority of them of which were male, and the sites of the oropharynx are described here. We had pretreatment biopsies in 50 out of 66 patients for which um, by an analysis that was developed at the University of Michigan, 40, 42 of 50 were available for DNA isolation and then PCR analysis for HPV. We had 27 patients who were HPV positive and 15 patients who were HPV negative, 24 for which um, the status was unavailable. So of the 66 patients, we had 54 responders, 49 of which were um, taken and treated with organ preservation, 33 of which had a neck dissection, all of which had negative lymph nodes at the time of dissection. There were 11 non-responders, 9 were taken to um, surgery up front. And what we found here was that, um, compared to our larynx study, that um, salvage surgery was really not um, an ideal way to treat these patients up front, and that the majority of the patients died. And the question remains is, um, was this related to the comorbid effects of to perhaps tobacco and alcohol, or the alterations in the tumor itself by the exposure to um, induction chemotherapy as compared to a different tumor, i.e. the larynx? But overall, the majority of the patients who um, were treated with combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy did well, and of those who did well, those were HPV positive. But I'd like to focus in on these green boxes here and the fact that there were still patients who were HPV positive, whether they received surgery or radiation therapy and chemotherapy, who um, lost their lives to the cancer, primarily due to distant metastases. And there were also a subgroup of patients who were HPV negative who did well when they were treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Of this particular group of four patients, we found that um, those patients were also epidermal growth factor negative. Interesting to note is the patients who are alive who had surgery, um, the HPV status unfortunately is not known. So just like with the ECOG study, we saw an overwhelming um, benefit for patients who are HPV positive compared to those who are HPV negative in terms of their overall survival. 
And we also found that um, survival was improved by the titer or copy number of HPV, as seen with induction chemotherapy and in the study as, whole, as a whole. So disease-specific survival by epidermal growth factor intensity, as we know and has been alluded to, the higher expressors in general do worse, and that's what we found in our study as well as compared to patients who um, were lower expressors of epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, when we combined these two together, we found out that the patients, again, who were EGFR negative and HPV negative and did quite well, and that, as would be expected, those who were HPV negative and high epidermal growth factor receptor expression did the worst. But what's interesting here is to find that there was some alteration or change in the fact that patients who were HPV positive had improved survival um, when they had high epidermal growth factor expression um, along with their tumor. Um, interestingly, we found, too, that in never smokers, um, the a mean um, epidermal growth factor intensity was much lower than patients who were former current smokers. And the same um, played out with gender as well. And the patients, the female patients had higher expressions of epidermal growth factor receptor. These patients who had high expression of the epidermal growth factor receptor in both cohorts um, did worse. It was interesting to note too that actually all the women in this study were um, smokers or former smokers. Um, in terms of looking at wild type um, P53 along with um, low um, BCLX long, we found those patients did the best. And from previous work done at our institution, those patients are sensitive to cisplatin. And those patients with low P53 wild type and BCLX long are actually cisplatin um, resistant. So what can, can we conclude from all this in terms of you know, prognosis? HPV tumor status and copy number are strongly associated with a therapeutic response to um, survival. Now we can see that certainly in, in two separate studies. And that gender, smoking status, and clinical factors as well as biomarkers may help us to predict survival and to guide treatments. So given the potential prognostic value of these biomarkers, we believe that future clinical trials should begin to tailor treatments based on good or poor prognosis tumors. So instead of treating patients up front and then analyzing them to see if they were HPV positive and if they did better or worse, we believe we should take patients who are HPV positive, perhaps low epidermal growth factor expression or receptor, um, which is low or negative, or other biomarkers, and tailor them with a particular treatment compared to those patients who we, who believe, we believe are at higher risk to develop distant metastases or local regional disease. So what role will the quadrivalent vaccine have on the incidence of head and neck cancer? So we're going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about um, prevention. At this point in time, we really have no idea whether or not the present vaccine, Gardasil, will actually protect um, patients from developed oral pharyngeal carcinomas. What we do know, however, is that um, the antibodies um, that are detected against E6 and E7, um, indicating um, serolo serologic marker 2 HPV can also be detected in the um, oral fluid. So it, it makes sense to think that this may actually provide some degree of protection. Um, we know, too, that um, the Gardasil vaccine, um, which is now indicated in um, young women, actually pr um, provides protection against HPV 16 and 18 related vaginal and vulvar intrathelial um, neoplasia, as you can see here by the three pooled studies together. And um, from work um, in a canine model that um, dogs that were vaccinated developed high antibody titers and had 100% effectiveness in preventing papillomas. And this was actually work that um, drove the um, vaccine program for um, the prevention of HPV-related related, um, intra, um, vaginal intra, um, neal, epithelial neoplasia. So in terms of head and neck cancer, we know there are about 563,000 cases um, worldwide. And we know that um, the attributable faction, so those by serologic markers um, to E6 and E7, is about 15,000 cases per year. And it may be a little higher because we know that all patients don't seroconvert. And we know that those attributed actually to HPV um, incorporated into their tumors is about 82% or 82,000. So we think that maybe between 15,000 and 82,000 cases can be prevented um, by patients receiving the um, HPV vaccine. So this is a picture of my 10-month-old son, and questions now arise, what do we do for him and um, future cohorts? 
in terms of um, the vaccination, when should these um, vaccinations begin? At what ages? Um, there's work actually that was published this month in the Journal of Pediatrics from our own institution um, that discusses um, high-risk sexual behavior sexual behavior in um, young girls does not necessarily predict um, who's going to develop these um, high-risk um, HPV um, subtypes and dysplasia. So the point being from the article is that we should not necessarily discount um, young girls um, from getting the vaccine if they have been sexually active, but rather sh um, adequate screening should be done, and the fact that we should probably be vaccinating these young girls as early as possible. Currently, the recommendation for vaccination um, begins at age um, nine. Um, secondly, what about adolescent boys? Um, there's talk about this now saying, well, it's a vaccine. Perhaps the vaccines, you know, should be given to everybody. There's ongoing work looking at the answer to this question by the company. We have to keep in mind, too, that there's limited supply of this vaccine and that the vaccine is not cheap and um, it would not necessarily be recognized by the insurance carriers um, for coverage um, in adolescent boys since there's not adequate proof. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this quote from Bill Clinton, is oral sex considered sex? And the point of this being is the fact that um, vaccination programs, I think, are primarily the way to prevent this um, illness and um, these cancers. However, we will do a disservice if we don't talk to our adolescent um, children and young children about sex education, and that this is now considered a sexually transmitted disease leading to these um, devastating cancers. So it should be incorporated into our homes, our synagogues, our churches, our schools, um, where sex education is important. Um, it's interesting, after our article was published, um, there was a review in the New York Times, and I noticed um, actually one of the Planned Parenthood websites had a link um, to that article. So I think it's important that this education actually be brought forth into the community. So some take-home points then um, in regards to treatment. HPV-related squamous cell carcinomas respond more favorably to treatment. However, we still don't know what the ideal treatment regimen for this patient population is. Perhaps we can get by with um, less intense treatment. Those questions still need to be answered in clinical trials. In terms of prognosis, the combination of HPV titer with other biomarkers, um, i.e. the epidermal growth factor receptor, and perhaps other clinical parameters um, such as gender and smoking may play a key role in treatment. And in terms of prevention, um, the change in sexual practices amongst young sexually ad active adolescents um, appears to play an important role um, role in transmission of HPV, and the role of HPV vaccination and prevention of squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck currently is not yet known. Thank you. Frank, thank you. Prevention of squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck currently is not yet known. Thank you. Frank, thank you uh, for, the, for that nice review. I just want to you know, introduce now Lori Lovner is going to be our last speaker uh, that we've, we're much waited for here. Now, we, get, we did get started a few minutes late, and I think that there's nothing uh, scheduled in here for about a half hour after. So I know that some of you have to leave right on time, but we want to make sure that Lori has her, her full 15-minute compliment. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if we could dim the lights just a tiny bit, because I've got a lot of sexy grayscale. And I can, can assure you that functional MR imaging is not having sex. So, but the images are sexy. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes is discuss uh, some cutting edge, cutting envelope type advances in imaging that take us beyond image interpretation and anatomy in assessing early treatment response to cancer, and especially in putting patients in the right treatment limb preferably at the time they're diagnosed, but if not, within the first few weeks of their treatment paradigm. I'd like to disclose that the work that I'm presenting today is funded by an R01 from the NIH and the uh, Cancer Institute, and i also like to disclose that I'm a consultant for Icon Medical Imaging. I read thousands of cases every year for many of your patients that are probably in blinded clinical trials. I'm completely blinded to the drugs they're on, um, but I do do a lot of head and neck cancer trials. I also want to acknowledge my collaborators. I work with a tremendous group of physicists and radiation therapists, oncologists. We just lost to Sloan Kettering, my wonderful research coordinator, Alex Kilger, as well as uh, my surgical crew um, who helps get our patients to us. So what I'd like to do in the next 
12 to 15 minutes is establish um, how, where we're moving with functional MRI. I think it is very clear from the presentations we've heard this week in other imaging sections and in other sections that have co incorporated imaging that we have moved very far in the development of imaging in the last 15 to 20 years. Remember, gadolinium didn't exist 14 years ago. And it is very clear that the role that MR plays in staging anatomically our patients with oropharyngeal cancers, and very importantly, providing surgical landmarks for those patients that may not be surgical candidates, such as tumors that extend up to the eustachian tube orifice or tumors that extend into the precervical fascia. I think we've heard a lot of wonderful talks this week on the merging of anatomic imaging with functional imaging, and in this paradigm, we've presented predominantly PET imaging. And what I'd like to do for the remainder of my talk is talk about techniques in functional MRI and talk about how these might be applied in the future to looking at patients with advanced cancers and trying to predict response to therapy either early in therapy or preferably at the time they're diagnosed looking at biochemical markers and tissue perfusion. So when we talk about functional MR imaging, there are several types of functional imaging that we may apply. There is diffusion-weighted imaging, which looks at the diffusivity of water, intracellular and extracellular water. There is dynamic contrast-enhanced perfusion imaging, uh, which is an indirect measurement of angiogenesis, but it's important to remember that perfusion and capillary leak are not necessarily a direct reflection of angiogenesis. And there is spectroscopy, conventional proton, and we also do some phosphorus imaging more often with lymphoma, but we're now applying it in head and neck cancer. And I will say this looks at the metabolic environment of tumors when we suppress out water, but the results here have been much less consistent and much less promising than diffusion-weighted imaging and perfusion MR. So what is diffusion MR imaging? Diffusion MR imaging is setting up our gradients in multiple directions to come up with an average look at the microscopic motion of water in the intracellular and extracellular compartments. It provides information regarding tissue cellularity, which in some sense is inversely proportional to the microscopic motion of water. And it's important to recognize that as you are looking at images for diffusion-weighted imaging, we provide two sets of images. One is the diffusion-weighted image, and when a cellular tumor has restricted diffusion, which means less water motion, it will be bright on the diffusion-weighted imaging, but we go on to get apparent diffusion coefficient maps, which takes out the T2 shine effects of the T2-weighted image. So a lesion with restricted diffusion um, should be dark on an ADC map. Applications in head and neck cancer that you may have seen recently in the, the spectrum of ENT, radiation, and imaging literature. Uh, there's been papers looking at distinguishing head and neck neoplasms from other benign tumors. I find that relatively fruitless in that most of these lesions will go on to biopsy anyhow. But I do think there is important emerging literature at looking for metastatic disease in nodes that are otherwise normal on conventional imaging nodes that are not enlarged by our arbitrary size criteria, and nodes that do not demonstrate architectural abnormalities on conventional MR images. I think it will have a role at looking for residual and or recurrent tumor, especially in the neck, but also in the primary site. Uh, most of this presentation will focus on nodal disease, though our work also was looking at the primary tumors in oropharyngeal cancer. And again, what we would expect is that residual tumor following therapy or recurrent neoplasm would demonstrate restricted diffusion on a diffusion-weighted imaging or be dark on an apparent diffusion coefficient map. And most importantly, what we really hope to do um, with a large series of patients is start to study tumors at presentation. What do they look like pre-treatment? What is their diffusion measurements? And will we be able either before therapy or within a week or two of therapy, not only to monitor who's responding to therapy, but perhaps to predict 
who is going to be a responder to therapy and who isn't and to get patients in the right treatment limb uh, at the get-go. I just want to let you know that our study has looked at now about 45 patients. I'm going to present the data on the first 35 because we have better clinical outcome and pathology results. It's important to see that we have 26 complete responders. 15 of these went on to pathology and had negative disease both at the primary and the next site. And the rest of the patients did not go on to surgery but have been followed by imaging and uh, conventional clinical examination. And we have nine patients um, with only a partial response or non-responders. So let's look at this diffusion image. If we could dim the lights a little bit, because this is a grayscale kind of thing, that would be helpful. You will see that we have pretreatment imaging, one week into therapy imaging, and post-treatment imaging. The two important areas to look at are these two time points. You will see I have images from conventional T2-weighted imaging, images from conventional T1-weighted imaging, images from gadolinium-enhanced imaging here, and then you will see uh, the T2 pixel image from the diffusion-weighted imaging, but most importantly, the ADC map, the apparent diffusion coefficient map that looks at these neoplasms. Uh, what we have done here is we have picked the largest solid nodal mass in the neck and have followed it through its treatment chorus. But again, our goal is to look at the pretreatment imaging or the early imaging to predict who may respond to therapy. You will see that over time, the volume of the tumor um, does on conventional imaging decrease. It's also important to remember that many of the techniques in the literature only look at one section. Our protocol gets eight sections, eight different slices, in 2.5 seconds with 2.5 cc's of contrast going in, and we start imaging at five seconds into the injection, and it allows us to do volume-rendered information. If we want to look here at the down and dirty of a complete responder, this is pretreatment, and if you look very closely, I have an arrow showing marked decreased signal intensity in this large nodal mass. This is consistent with restricted water diffusion, decreased diffusicity. <laughs> increased intracellular water, decreased extracellular water, and you will also see that one week into therapy, the apparent diffusion coefficient goes up, which means there's more water diffusi diffusicity, <laughs> and um, these are good predictors of patients that are going to go on to have a complete response. Let's look at some of our partial responders. Again, both of these patients were surgically proven. We have pretreatment, one week, and post-treatment. And you will see in this patient, if we go to the ADC map, that there is not restricted diffusion in this large solid nodal mass at presentation. And furthermore, as we look at time points early in therapy, we see that the apparent diffusion coefficient does not change significantly. There is not a lot of restricted diffusion, and these patients seem to be partial or non-responders. If you look at the longitudinal changes, and we did compare 1.5 to 3-point Tesla imaging, um, I'll point out a few things. This box right here represents the complete responders. The box with the notch here is the partial responders. But I think there's two things you want to pay attention to. If you look at the apparent diffusion coefficient, it has a predictive value based on the pretreatment scan. And you will see here that there is restricted diffusion early on before therapy. And you will also see another important predictor of who's going to have a response to therapy is increase in the ADC. And you can see that here. You can see the complete responders compared to the partial responders. The other thing I wanted to point out to you that I think is interesting, I do a lot of volume work with MR imaging and a lot of work on inter-observer and intra-observer variability using volume imaging. And while there is no doubt on the images that I showed you that the volume of the dominant nodal mass certainly decreases over time with therapy, it's important to look that at any time point, pretreatment or one week into therapy, or in fact post-therapy, that there was not a statistically significant difference in the volumes at any point. So in other words, the volume did not predict at the end in the surgical patients who was going to have residual disease in the neck, even though it may have decreased uh, significantly in size.
Let's talk briefly about dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, which we gently refer to as perfusion. We all know that malignant tumors require angiogenesis to grow and proliferate. We know that angiogenesis regarding dynamic contrast enhanced MRI may be an uh, indicator of tissue permeability and perfusion. We know that the microcirculation of tumors is different than the surrounding normal tissues, that the vascular channel of tumors is different than the normal interstitium. And we also know that diffusion contrast enhanced MR, a reflection of perfusion, looks at blood, through and per blood flow and permeability through the tissue. We have noted that tumors have high perfusion and relative blood volumes compared to normal tissue. This is exquisitely elegant when you look at GBMs in the brain. And we all know that tumor perfusion has a strong correlation with oxygenation and hypoxia. So I think what you want to take home from today as we start to, to push the envelope in looking at functional MRI and not as a diagnostic tool, but as a predictive tool in risk predicting who's going to respond to therapy and ultimately to long-term outcomes. I think what I want you to take home, and there's no way I could go through all the technical factors, but I think it's important for you to know that we as radiologists with wonderful physicists and a lot of post-processing have the ability not only to perform, but to tease out and evaluate many quantitative and physiologic parameters of tumors. Again, this requires a lot of post-processing following imaging. We, our assessments physiologically, again, are volumetric assessments. We do multiple slices every two and a half seconds. And we also have a new paradigm where we have a, a technique that allows us to do motion correction. And the three uh, parameters that I'm going to talk about today, but we're going to emphasize, the first is K-trans, which is an indicator of tissue perfusion and vascular permeability. Then there's VE, which is the extravascular, extracellular space, or what we might refer to as the interstitium. And you can even see Ti represents that we can start to look at the half-life of a water molecule in the cell in a measurement of seconds. So this is a diffusion contrast enhanced MRI in a patient that was a complete responder. Again, we have surgical proof. This is their pretreatment scan, one week into therapy, post-therapy, again, conventional T2-weighted image, conventional T1-weighted image, and what I want to call your attention to here are a few things. First of all, here's K-trans, and here's the interstitial. You can see the different color coding in the maps and how we are able to tweak out the interstitial space from the vascular permeability. And I think the other important thing that you want to look at, here's the scale here showing you low to high perfusion or permeability. And tumors with moderate to high perfusion pre-treatment seem to do much better, and many go on to be complete responders. And early into treatment, again, you want to look at the perfusion, and frequently increased K-trans reflects people that are going to be early responders. This is a patient that had only a partial response, again, pre-treatment, one week into therapy, post-treatment. Again, here is your scale going from blue to red with increasing K-trans. And I think if you look here, you see the K-trans has relatively low perfusion at the onset and doesn't change much over time, relatively little perfusion. And uh, these patients did not go on to be complete responders. I want to finish up with MR spectroscopy. I want to describe to you a little bit about how it is and what we do. I will share with you that our results in this realm have not been nearly as reliable, reproducible, or promising as we had hoped. Um, we're moving on to three Tesla imaging, which does provide some advantages using the high field strength. MR spectroscopy looks at cellular biochemistry. It, it, conventional MRI, we're basically imaging the resonance of free water. In spectroscopy, what we are doing is suppressing the water in order to assess the resonances from all the other tissues around and within the neoplasm. We're looking at metabol met metabolites of both normal and neoplastic tissue, and I will share with you some of the problems.